Dear colleagues, friends, participants of the Longevity Medicine Workshop 2021 at the ARDD, thank you very much for joining and please allow me to share my screen so that we can commence a very brief lecture talking about longevity medicine in the clinic. And of course, in 20 minutes, I can give not more than just a very brief scratch of what longevity medicine is and how we as physicians can care for longevity patients. What are the practical applica applications um, of longevity medicine and how can we educate ourselves and how can the resources be used uh, that are providing education of practicing physicians in longevity medicine. Short introduction of myself. My name is Evelyn Bischoff. I was trained in Germany. Um, I'm a medical doctor and a clinician, specialist in internal medicine. Did my internship at Harvard in Columbia, went then to Switzerland where I had a um, very great chance to um, pursue my residency and fellowship at the University's Hospital of Zurich and then Basel where I've been um, working as an attending physician up until the moment where I came to China. I've been actually between Switzerland and China for over a decade, um, both as a clinician and as a researcher and also as a, as a professor, so also involved in teaching. And overall, um, with all this uh, international experience, one has to say that we all clinicians, doctors, we are sharing more or less the same challenges and opportunities. Therefore, especially in longevity medicine, it is quite easy to see the trajectories. And so, as I mentioned, I was um, coming from the background of uh, practicing medicine in uh, Switzerland, mostly academic medicine. And right now I'm based in China where I'm working at the Renji Hospital as an internal medicine physician. And um, moreover, I am also a longevity physician at the HLI in San Diego. So it is my extreme, extreme pleasure to co-organize and co-lead the Longevity Medicine Workshop this year, uh, because it is very important to bring clinicians and practicing physicians together um, and get, get informed, get informed what longevity medicine really is, what are the core concepts and core key drivers in, um, in longevity medicine, and ultimately shape the field so that the very much progressed gerosciences can then be finally implemented in the real world, so in the work with the patient. So another question is very often coming from physicians and patients, what is longevity medicine? And there is still no official definition coming from any of the medical bodies. However, um, we have tried to define it in, in our recent Nature Aging paper as a branch of precision medicine that is focused very specifically of promoting, optimizing the health span and the lifespan. So the healthy lifespan of a patient. And this focus is powered by AI technology. So the cutting edge AI technology. So in simple words, longevity medicine is not anti-aging or life extension per se, but it is the extension and optimization of the period of life of a patient that is lived in good health, in good quality. Um, otherwise, we can say we are extending the healthy lifespan in good quality of life or optimizing or extending the period of life with or within optimal health and optimal performance of the patient. Now, I'm referring um, to um, everybody as a patient simply because I see aging as a disease. And um, if aging will be defined at some point of time as a disease, then uh, until we find a cure, we are all uh, somewhat suffering from it. Therefore, uh, please excuse me, and I am referring uh, 
to to um, to most uh, of us uh, or to, to all of us as as patients. Um, now, longevity medicine can also be defined uh, simply by by its characteristics. At this very moment, as we can see, longevity medicine is under the umbrella of the AI. So it's AI driven, AI powered. And it encompasses a lot of elements such as uh, being extremely data driven and focused toward, towards individualization. So it's an individualized medicine with a focus also on prevention, but not in a primary prevention as we know it from our traditional medicine perspective, but an extremely early prevention that is actually also detecting the risk of a potential development of a disease and then developing techniques to mitigate those risks and ultimately also of eliminating those risks so that the patient hopefully will never get to the point to, to be there for the primary pre prevention. Longevity medicine is also very much focused on biomarkers, identifying new biomarkers, specifically biomarkers of aging. And as we know, having biomarkers and having the right tools to quantify what we need to measure is the only way to then further develop predictive and prognostic um, outcomes, including biomarkers, to build trajectories towards therapies and to further collect data that then can fuel um, identification of new biomarkers. So it's a perpetually um, evolving field that is co-shaped and co-fueled by both the patient and the doctor, and of course the science, um, simply because this specific discipline will always be growing as the data is growing. And as the data is growing, the machine is learning. And as the machine is learning, new algorithms are being developed. So it is, it is, it is a circle that is um, constantly fueling itself. What is very important for, for, for me as a physician is to really underline that longevity medicine is a, hopefully soon to be a new discipline, but it's definitely a field that is fueled by cutting edge research, by science. And it always uh, should keep this umbrella of, of, of science in it. So it's not only um, something that is truly basically experimental or is, um, is, is leading to one, towards anti-aging in a perhaps not credible way, but it is really a cutting edge um, medicine that is sometimes perhaps not extremely visible at the first sight. Therefore, it's important to, to learn about it and to know what are the tools behind longevity medicine that are then applied in, um, in the real world while, when leading um, a, a patient. So as you can see here on this, on this uh, diagram, longevity medicine applies a lot of AI powered tools. And those tools uh, involve a lot of um, targets such as, as we mentioned, biomarkers, but also then um, drug design, new protein design, um, new clinical trial designs, so that at the end of the day, we can have evidence. So then later we can build also guidelines and, and, and further trajectories. And um, at the end of the day, all of these tools are there to enable physicians and patients to hopefully identify new interventions to slow down some of the age-related processes that are leading to diseases both physically and psychologically. Now, the traditional medicine is usually um, targeting a patient within a specific um, age frame that we are used to because our clinical trials are usually targeting the patients in a specific um, age range. And uh, most of those trials are then uh, providing us with some of the solutions that we are applying to bring the patient mostly from the state of being sick to the state of being healthy or healthier. Now, in longevity medicine, the ultimate goal is 
not only to bring the patient from healthy to um, to uh, from, from um, sorry from unhealthy to healthy, but from the actual current biological age as defined by the biological aging clock um, that uh, some of my colleagues will be talking about and myself also a little bit later. So the actual biological age of the patient, not the chronological age as in traditional medicine, and then bringing the patient from the current biological age to the biological age where the patient will be in the optimal performance um, point of his lifetime. And this is only possible at this very moment um, with the help of data. And those data are coming from, from the molecular level up to the systemic and epigenetic level. So all the omics, genomics, proteomics, lipidomics, all the precision medicine um, imaging, all the pictures, and all the longitudinal monitoring of the patients that are also very often now provided by the patients themselves. So all the vital signs monitoring, glucose monitoring, sleep, and so on. All of those data are helping us to define where the patient is at and how we can optimize um, his or her, her health and to bring um, the patient to the, to the right biological age of the optimal performance. And what is needed in order for, um, for us to know where the patient is at and where the patient should be, um, that's the work of the AI and specifically deep learning and then transfer learning. And we'll have some excellent talks about that um, among our panelists uh, coming from the AI sciences. Now, we know that academic medicine is very much characterized by uh, the physician assuming three roles. On the one hand, we have to be the clinicians, we have to be the practicing doctors. On the other hand, we have to be teachers. So we are responsible to, to shape the next generation of medicine. And we have to be involved at, at, some, at some level um, in the science, so in the research. And at the end of the day, in longevity medicine, it's exactly the same. However, here we are not only clinicians that are bound to our Hippocratic oath, but we are also facing something that is very, very new and that emerged just now, which is big data and data that are very new to us, data that we have never really been exposed to. So we are not data scientists and nobody should expect us to be a data scientist, but, but we should be aware that data um, can help us and we should be aware of the techniques that are there and we should definitely develop a right way to communicate with AI and data scientists in order for us to then implement the trajectories, the solutions, whatever is there that is beneficial for our patients, which is our ultimate goal and our ultimate um, obligation. Now, we know that AI is definitely transforming the world. And one of the biggest revolutions in, in, the, in the path of the AI was the deep learning revolution in, um, in the early uh, 2010, 12. Why is it important for us as physicians? Um, because medicine is more and more implementing the solutions of the so-called deep learning and transfer learning. And this is the most important technique for us to understand in longevity medicine, because we can now have a lot of data that are usually not very heterogeneous and um, not exactly um, uh, very uh, clean, as to say. Deep learning has allowed us to use this high dimensional data um, to build trajectories according to our objective function. So for example, we can say we want the patient to be healthy and the patient is now not healthy. So the objective goal is, is to make him healthy. Of course, that would be very, very simple. So we are uh, targeting for specific diseases uh, or specific uh, subsets of the patient's parameters uh, towards some, some disease. But uh, ultimately, that's, um, that's exactly the goal. 
However, what I wanted to mention is that um, artificial intelligence and human intelligence are very much interconnected. And we see that the societies and, and the human behaviors uh, are changing right now, are being transformed by the AI, um, not only in the, in the world of investments, in the world of uh, daily life of, uh, of all of us, but also in the science. And so the amount of papers, the amount of research that is being done right now, as you can see, is really exploding in the arena of AI. So it's undeniable that AI is transforming medicine. And we see that already. We leave um, this transformation as we speak. We see the states of arts of labs. We see the big data entering our daily work. We see the deep learning and AI and virtual reality uh, being applied in the education of the students and our own education, so with all the simulation labs. We see digital hospitals arising and we see uh, hospitals transferring towards digitalization, blockchain, etc., internet hospitals. We see robotics entering not only the field of surgery, but uh, pretty much all of other fields, uh, slowly but surely. And we see very positive development also in the, in the area of AI-based drug development. So we are on the way to the AI-driven precision medicine, and we are facing the the revolution, as to say, from the reactive to the proactive medicine and proactive on a very high level um, so that um, prevention uh, really gets a fully new definition and dimension. And uh, seeing the advent of AI in biomedical research and ultimately also medicine, we can safely say that if we can find a way to um, translate gerosciences that are truly at a very advanced stage already um, towards or into the medical practice, that would be something that would significantly improve the healthy lifespan. So this is exactly what the longevity is all about, improving the healthy lifespan. And um, precision medicine has been a topic for a while. It then moved more towards personalized medicine. So as you can see here on the graph, up until 2015, the precision medicine publication amount was quite high. But then from that moment on, the personalized medicine uh, became a, a new phrase and a new focus. And, it, and it's very right. And it's, and it's not um, mutually exclusive. So the the, the further level, the upper level of precision medicine is the personalized, individualized medicine. So where we want to be at, at the end of the day, is really to have the right treatment or the right approach for a patient at a specific point of time of his or her life, at a specific point of time, and as, at, a, at, a, at a specific state of this patient. So we want to have really the ability to, to, to use the longitudinal data and then to transform them and apply them on a specific patient. And not even that, but really to be able to do it at a very specific point of time for that person. Why is this important for the population in general? Of course, and I am sure you have heard about that many, many times, but one of the main reasons why the field is uh, now trying to be so active in research and in, um, in the translation to the clinic is because we are really facing the so-called silver tsunami. So the aging population, the population of, of uh, people who are aged um, is growing. And that wouldn't be such a big of a problem. And because age, might just be a number. However, what we are facing is a huge amount of people with comorbidities, which uh, with uh, age-related diseases. And this is what makes um, not only the individualized uh, health and the personal life of the patient, the close family and friends, the circle, but also the entire society uh, is being affected by that. Therefore, it's important to learn about longevity medicine and longevity medicine education is something very near and dear to uh, most of the panelists of, of longevity medicine workshop. And uh, 
one of the publications that um, I suggest everybody to have a glimpse at is um, the publication uh, in Lancet Health and Longevity, where we are outlining um, why it is important to learn about longevity medicine and also um, what are the approaches to build a structure for longevity medicine education for physicians and why it is um, important and how can this be done in the nascent field of longevity medicine. One of the approaches towards such uh, an educational endeavor was the very first longevity medicine course for physicians that we created with our colleagues and um, the main founder, um, Professor Javoronkov, will be talking about it in his, um, in, in his lecture. Uh, however, um, this course was one of the first steps towards promoting longevity medicine education for MDs, but not only for MDs. And this course has been recently also awarded with CME accreditation and it's growing exponentially. What are the core features or the core areas that physicians should be looking at? And um, at this point of time, mostly self-educate, but also reach out to, to longevity physicians that are um, actually already practicing longevity medicine. Number one, senescence. So understanding what is senescence and what is aging and what are the differences and what are the hallmarks of aging and uh, which of the pathways are important. Secondly, knowing the difference between geroprotectors and senolytics and how those influence or might influence the pathways of, um, of aging and, uh, and senescence and what are the current applicances and the current credibility of the available GER protectors and uh, sonor mediators. So here are some of the pathways that are outlined and I will not go into the depth, uh, inviting everybody to take the course and to learn about at least the basics of the pathways and then where are the current interventions um, that are being applied. What I personally would like to focus on is actually the clinical implementations of those and how to approach a patient, because knowing the science is one thing. And then, as we know, in our clinic, we have a, a major biovariability. And also among aged persons, we know that we have those who are extremely fit and we have those who are extremely frail. Um, for the lack of other uh, definitions and quantifications at this moment, we are mostly using the frailty as, as our criterion. And so we need to know which interventions, which diagnostics we should use for um, any of that group, and especially for those who are in between those two extremes. For this, luckily, we are now facing an era of an extremely um, advanced clinical precision diagnostics. And this arena is, of course, booming, including um, precision imaging, uh, imaging, I'm sorry, <laughs> precision imaging, um, precision um, screening of the entire omic. So uh, genetics and proteomics, lipidomics, uh, microbiome plays a very, very important role. And of course, um, and of course, uh, a huge amount of data that is uh, being created from now so-called liquid biopsies or um, monitoring of um, the patient, as I mentioned before, partially done by the patient, him or herself, or in the clinic. What is very useful at this very moment are the so-called aging clocks. So aging clocks have been around since. Uh, at least 2013 with uh, Dr. Horvath um, publishing the first paper on aging clock. And now with the deep learning advancements, advancements we also have the deep aging clocks uh, of uh, various uh, methods. So methylation clocks, epigenetic clocks, we have blood clocks and others. We have another separate um, a lecture on, on, on this topic that I recommend you to watch. 
my point um, here would be how do we apply the deep aging clocks actually in the clinic and why are they useful for us as clinicians? Um, mostly because we can, first of all, comprehensively combine several uh, types of clocks together. Um, not only the methylation epigenetic clock that is most attached in the, the, the genetics, so something that is more or less static, just um, of course also uh, uh, modifiable, but uh, but more or less static, not as much um, not as much dynamic as, for example, the anamnestic clock or the psychological clock or the blood clock. So something that I love to use uh, in uh, in my practice with longevity patients. Uh, is definitely the age matrix um, blood clock, where I can see what is the actual biological age of the patient versus his or her chronological age. And then also having a deep dive analysis on the parameters that are influencing the biological age um, and having the algorithm to predict the optimal um, biological age of the patient. So with those information, I know where the patient is at, where the patient should be at, and what are the parameters that should be changed and to which extent. So this gives me a lot of information for me to be then active and to work with, together with the patient to optimize his or her biological age and his or her performance. Here are some examples of, uh, of, uh, of patients who have been predicted biologically older and some of the analysis and outputs of the parameters that are showing me uh, which of those are actually um, making the patient biologically older or making the patient biologically older in a very, very simplified way um, explained. Yeah, so uh, we are usually uh, looking only at uh, those values in the clinic that are out of ranges um, that, are, that are predicted in our laboratory. However, we need to remind ourselves that those ranges have been trained or not trained, they, they have been predicted and set um, by randomized clinical trials uh, that have been run um, quite some time ago. And uh, usually we're only looking at a specific range of chronological age of patients. So using this type of precision diagnostic is definitely more personalized and individualized. And based on this, I can then further go back to the patient with an extremely comprehensive anamnesis, with a very comprehensive current and past medical history, and with a very comprehensive precision diagnostics, including the transcriptomics, um, proteomics, and the entire omics, the microbiome, and so on, and create a granular longevity protocol where I will have some of the data being monitored longitudinally, some of the, some of the parameters through the 24 7, so CGM or, or the blood, measure, uh, blood pressure measurement, or um, I, I truly uh, like to also have the, the sleep monitoring, including the blood oxygen and so on. And then um, also modify this protocol according to the patient's needs. So, of course, uh, we have a perfect longevity protocol for those patients who are uh, de novo coming as healthy patients where we cannot. Uh, see any of, um, of the need of, of immediate reactive medicine health optimization. However, some of the patients do have comorbidities, do have underlying diseases, do have um, an increased, uh, for example, risk that was in, identified in the uh, genetic uh, deep dive. So um, for those patients, of course, the longevity protocol has to be modified. So everything in longevity medicine is extremely personalized and individualized. There are some of the trajectories that, uh, that are common, and some of the paths that uh, should be followed for all the patients. However, at the end of the day, um, the bioavailability and the individualization here um, is, is, is the acute um, priority. Now, we still have, I would say, more of open questions and question marks in the field than answers. For example, how do we monitor specific levels of some of the biomarkers 
of aging, uh, which doses of the drug protectors should we recommend at this moment, which uh, are the credible interventions, which patients are actually at risk um, to receive some of the drug protective treatments, how do we actually comprehensively measure the age, um, how can we assure that we can um, take really the, the best combination of the, of, the, of the aging clocks and apply them to the patient, um, and so on. So there are many open questions. However, it is important that if we want to shape the future medicine, we need to be proactive ourselves as clinicians and embrace this new field consciously, um, knowing that the quality of the data that we will be providing will ultimately also have an impact of the outcomes and an impact of our future uh, practice of medicine, because they will be then further shaping the algorithms that um, inevitably at some point of time will become one of our golden standards in most of our practices. At this point of time, I would like to thank you very much for your attention and wish you a wonderful um, and very productive time at the Longevity Medicine Workshop. Thank you.